Hello and welcome to this edition of Renaissance Wednesday. I'm your guide for this expedition, Adele. And I want to thank you for joining in to learn about another Renaissance artist. Every Wednesday on Art Expeditions, on the blog, artexpeditiontours.com, you can check out our latest post about the Renaissance, uh, the culture, the history, and of course, the art. Um, but I'm also trying to do these weekly uh, videos uh, and, and mini podcasts, if you will, vlogs, just to give you a little extra understanding of the content in the in the blog, because sometimes it's easier to uh, to check it out on YouTube or Vimeo. But yeah, we're going to get into a really exciting artist today. So last couple of weeks, we've been talking about kind of the introducing you to the birth of the Renaissance and, and how it kind of formed. So we talked about Brunelleschi, who was a fame and renowned architect, even to this day. I mean, some of his designs, modern day architects don't even know how he did it. You know, I mean, that's how amazing he was, right? He created the Florence uh, Duomo, which is, is very well known in Florence. It's the cathedral. We talked about that in an earlier uh, uh, blog and how uh, I bring this up because it kind of prefaces what we're going to talk about today, which is Ghiberti, a contemporary of Brunelleschi's. And often they were vying for the same projects and in competition that way. Um, but Brunelleschi created, or at least was the first to document something we call linear perspective. Uh, Giotto, who we also talked about on our early Renaissance Wednesday, who was a kind of what, in my opinion, one of the founders of the Renaissance. Some people put him in the Middle Ages, but um, Giotto almost got there, but didn't quite get there. Brunelleschi went to Rome. He was studying like the Pantheon and all this ancient architecture. He even went there with like Donatello, which is interesting. And Brunelleschi figured out the system called linear perspective, where the easiest way to, to, for us to understand it, because we're just so used to it and, and the way we, we see images today, uh, is think about those train tracks that start off pretty big and then kind of disappear into the horizon line. You have a vanishing point. You kind of have a center of the picture. That is set, essentially is linear perspective. And, and in the Middle Ages and, and even prior, they didn't really have a full grasp on how to do that art, from an art perspective. They were pretty close. Um, but that's what really kind of laid the groundwork for the Renaissance and completely revolutionized art, architecture. I mean, just the way that you see the world. So I bring that up because this is also very important with Ghiberti and how he was able to take that linear perspective and basically start in many ways the, the Renaissance going from kind of this this burgeoning idea to a real foundation. Like this is a shift in the way art and architecture and sculpture is done. I mean, along with his contemporaries, but he was, he, Brunelleschi, Masaccio, you can even, you know, Donatello, all of them kind of moving towards that. So who is Ghiberti? He was born just outside of Florence in the area of Tuscany. Um, in 1378. Now, it's important to remember that Italy was not unified. It actually didn't even become a country until like the 1880s, right? Um, uh, late 1800s. So there are all these different city-states, what they call communes, and it's not a commune like we would think of today, you know, where you go and meditate uh, and live off the land. It's just a city that was free and it was self-governed, or you had these city-states that may be in multiple territories or lands. And sometimes they would be in competition with each other. So, you know, for instance, Florence was always at war with Pisa and Siena and, and things like that because they were, it was not a structure of like a central government. There are all these different mini governments and many ruling areas. Florence was considered a republic, although it was pretty much controlled by the Medici. Um, behind the scenes. And eventually they took con full control, which we'll get into, I'm sure, in the future on art expeditions, because that's so fascinating. But um, Florence really was kind of this, this place where you had a lot of bankers, you had a lot of investment, you had people who were kind of getting into this classical 
thought and really wanting to be educated and to do good things for their community and, and to invest in the community, especially those who had money, um, which is great. And that's why we have so much wonderful art from this period. So I preface that because you'll keep hearing about Florence, Florence, why Florence? A lot of it is just the culture and kind of this, by God's grace, bringing all these people together um, through unique circumstances to, to create this movement, right? Well, Ghiberti originally studied with his stepfather, who was a, who, who owned a goldsmith shop. He was very prominent. He worked with a lot of famous um, goldsmiths and sculptors. So he studied there, but the bubonic plague hit and it devastated Florence. I mean, uh, half of their population died. It was, it was a tragedy. I mean, it was like, un, like anything that had happened before in recent memory. Um, so during this time, Ghiberti's like, I got to get out of the city. I, I need to, to get out of here. So he actually had the opportunity to go to a town called Rimini, uh, where he worked for um, kind of the state there, creating some beautiful like frescoes. He loved to paint. He's known today as a sculptor, <laughs> but his true passion actually originally was painting. And he was working on these, you know, uh, these uh, series and, and, and frescoes for the walls of the castle. A lot of them were like religious art. When he heard about this competition in Florence, he was only he was only 21. But this Florence decided that they were announcing this competition. You know, the plague had kind of tapered off and they wanted to just do something, you know, to like get the city energized. Right. And it starts with these baptistry doors. So in 1401, there was an announcement saying we're having a competition for someone to come and design these baptistry doors at the, the baptistry of St. John the Baptist. Now let's pause for a second because this definitely excited Ghiberti because who doesn't like a competition? That's in the, the Italian spirit, I think, especially Florentines. They love a competition. You'll hear about this over and over again. There's always a competition for some building or something. Um, so he did get leave so he could go work on this and, and to attempt to get selected to be the one who created these doors. But why baptistry doors and why would they be having this competition? Let's back up a little bit and get into the history. So at this point, the Duomo hasn't been built. Uh, part of it has started to be built. The Duomo is the huge cathedral in Florence. Um, it's masterful. The foundations of that had started to be built, but the the dome was way off and that, that, that's something we'll get to in a future lecture. Um, but you had like Giotto's tower. He had done this Campanile cause they need uh, a bell tower. But before any of that was built, you had this gorgeous baptistry, which you see in this photo on the right. It, it's octagonal in shape um, as a lot of baptistries were. And it has this mix of marble because there's all this beautiful, like Carrara marble isn't that far from Florence, the quarries. You have all these different inlays and designs on the facade of this marble. It's beautiful. So uh, this, this baptistry dates to being built around um, the, the late, uh, it was like 11, it was finished in the 1100s. But some people had rumors that it had it used to be a, a, a Roman building that was built and, and all of this. There may have been some foundation, like originally, that were Roman and, and temples to like Roman gods and things before it got turned in to a church. But this building itself, is it, it dates to the um, 11th century and the 12th century. So it's medieval and it's Romanesque. And what we call Florentine Romanesque style, because as you can see with this intricate design and these colors, it's obviously more than just a Romanesque church. It's It's got its own unique Florentine appeal. Well, this was a beautiful baptistry. Everybody's getting baptized in the baptistry, which I'll get to that in a second. What is a baptistry? You know, but the thing is, when they built this, <laughs> they had one set of doors. And those weren't even finished until 1330. And they were done by another famous artist, Andrea Pisano, 
who was originally from Pisa um, and then kind of moved to Florence. And he did a great job with his baptistry doors. They were the East doors. But there's two other ways to get into the baptistry, and they did not have permanent doors there. I mean, there's coverings, and yeah, but there is no permanent door. And you have this beautiful facade, and it's like, it looks unfinished. And there's always delays back then because it took a long time. Plus, you have war, you have, you know, the plague was going on. There's all sorts of stuff that delays these projects, funding. Um, but it finally said in 1401, enough is enough. We got to finish these doors. And let's start with um, uh, the one set of doors. And we want it to, we'll have a competition to decide who's going to do them because we just need to get this done. And whoever can do it, we decide they're going to do it. And that's that. And it'll be done. So this call came out and a lot of famous sculptors, uh, I think there was four final entries, but you know, Brunelleschi was one and then Ghiberti, but he was an upstart. He was new. He was only 21 years old and he came in and he blew them away with his designs. He, uh, the, the competition was you had to do like a relief. And if you look on the left in the picture of the, the what we call the gates of paradise, this is a copy, but you can see how there's those little mini panels within the big door that tell each tell a different story. So he was, he was the, the competition. You were supposed to do one of those, but the sacrifice of Isaac from the old Testament was the theme. And the judges saw Gabertis and normally they are supposed to be quiet, not say anything, but like it were got around all over town. Like, Oh, this is amazing. You won't even believe. And this was before Brunelleschi even got to show his, his sample, which probably is why he, he was always a little annoyed with Gabertis, um, the rest of his life, but that's not Gabertis fault. Um, but Gabertis, um, you know, blew them away. And then of course they saw Brunelleschi's and it was equally amazing, but, they didn't know what to do at that point because here you have two masters of like all humanity, you know, God given talent here, get them to work together. Why can't you guys work together? Well, Brunelleschi said, no, I work alone. And it was for the best because guess what? He ended up getting his own commission. He got the Duomo, which yeah, is a wonder one, a wonder in itself, which we'll get to that, you know, future post, but Gaberti got the doors and man, did he ever open the doors not just to the baptistry, but to the entire Italian Renaissance. I've, I've heard from one um, professor um, say that this was the founding of the Italian Renaissance were these doors. It opened the doors to everything. I think that's one perspective. I think it was part of it, the founding of the Renaissance. Obviously, you look at Brunelleschi, some of his designs, architecture, even prior to this, or you look at Giotto, kind of like a forerunner. But this is big. This is huge because we kind of take these type of doors for granted. Now, if you go to like your local cathedral or, you know, you've been to Europe and you see them, but this was unlike anything they'd ever seen before. And it's actually two sets of doors and they're both unique. So it took Ghiberti, he was 21 when he started this, 21 years to complete the project. And they decided that the first set of doors would be the New Testament stories and they were bronze, and he did a marvelous job. And it told all these stories, you know, of the New Testament. We well, did such a great job that they commissioned him to finish the next set of doors. Because remember, there's three doors. Now you have two are completed. You still have one more. And it was the last set of doors that Michelangelo was so inspired by that he called them the gates of paradise. These doors... Uh, told tell the tale of the Old Testament. And I'll get to a picture of one in just a second. And they used linear perspective, this naturalism, scenes like you feel like you're in the scene. And each of these is very deeply theological. Um, obviously, he knew his, 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 litur his litur liturgy and his scripture, but they also bring you into the scene. And, and remind, remember, the Renaissance was kind of a movement after all this death, the bubonic, like people are just dying. You're like, God, what is going on? They're very faithful people, but they, and they start to remember that humanity in spite of all the sin and all the terribleness that separates from God and separates you from each other. But it also 
have to remember that God made humans to be good in his image. And that was something that kind of came out of all of this, because when you see all that death and all that heartache, you want to have hope. And you see the hope is that we're made in God's image and we have a chance to do some good things. Even if sin is a stumbling block at our core, we're good. And that's kind of a humanism aspect of the Renaissance. And Gaberti really takes off with that. Because if you look at this um, example of the gates of paradise, which were completed um, as a second commission and are really his masterpiece, they're both great. But you'll notice in the corner, you have um, God standing up and then Adam is like reclined in the left-hand corner. And he's kind of like, resting, but he's very like, there's no life in him. And God's like literally touching him or and like bringing life into him and having him rise. This image specifically influenced the way that Michelangelo did the Sistine Chapel and his interpretation that we've all seen and all admire and love and have probably memorized of, of God creating um, Adam and, you know, barely touching his hand. This definitely, this kind of representation, it really definitely, it, it inspired Michelangelo. What I like too, is you see is God's creating Eve and uh, just out of Adam and just this, this command that God has, but he's also looks very human, like in our image and he's, he's with them. It's like a relationship. And the, the scene of the sin, the, the taking of the apple is in the background because sin is something that happens in the shadows and separates us from God, whereas God's right out in the open, which to me is very the theological and powerful. If you're thinking about using this as a meditation, you know, when you're about to go into a baptistry. So let's pause for a second as you enjoy this gorgeous sample of his work. What was a baptistry? Um, a, a, if, if you're of Christian background or, or not, you, you might be aware that um, a, when, you, when you come into the faith, you get baptized um, in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. And that, that takes away your original sin. And it, it, it really brings you the Holy Spirit, the first, first gifts of the Holy Spirit and, and, and brings you as a member into the church. So um, in the Middle Ages and also the Re Renaissance for a long time, for various reasons, but the main reason was you didn't enter the church until you've been baptized. There are other opportunities for you to encounter and, and to learn about the faith and to join the church outside of actually being in the church. It wasn't like, let's just block people from the church, but that just was the formality of it. So before you to enter the church, you had to go first to the baptistry and then you were baptized. Once you were baptized, the gates of paradise <laughs> really opened because then that allowed you entrance into relationship with God and to take, you know, the first steps towards getting the mass and the Eucharist and all of that. But those buildings are usually separate. You'll see that even in like Ravenna, which we talked about on Medieval Monday um, in Italy. Uh, uh, and that, that church was built in like 540. They have a separate baptistry. A lot of times these, these are octagonal in shape. Um, and then, you know, you walk in and then you're able to, to get baptized, and then you're able to walk over to the church. Now in Florence, they're very proud of this baptistry because it is one so old, but it, it, it's just, it, it's always like this area of, of Florence, especially after the Duomo was completed, has always been just such a sense of pride and a symbol of one, the spiritual um, relationship of Florence with God and their, their, their faith and their patron saint is St. John. And this is the baptistry of St. John the Baptist, who obviously was the baptizer. Um, so, you know, it's very like this was the community. This was a community event. You think about when you have a baptism today or um, if, if you're another faith, maybe you have, you know, an, an event that you, you, you celebrate like an entry. Um, this was a social thing, too, as much into the community. So it has been said that you're not a true Florentine. <laughs> unless one, you grew up in the shadow of the Duomo, the, the, the cathedral, and you were baptized um, in the baptistry of St. John, because it is still an active church and you can get baptized there. Although, to be fair, <laughs> this city's grown and it sprawls. I mean, that's not completely making you a Florentine, but it is, as I was in Florence, that was what I was told. 
Um, so, you know, some of the famous people who were actually baptized here were like Dante, um, who uh, we'll, we'll get to Dante in a future, a future talk. He's in the Middle Ages, but Dante, you know, really kind of was a, a Renaissance man before there was one. And sadly, he was forced to be exiled from Florence which Florence has never really forgiven itself for. Um, they, they, you'll see Dante everywhere. But that being said, Ghiberti created this beautiful image, these beautiful doors, and they have continued to inspire so many artists. And it, it's something you have to see. Now, when you go to Florence, you will not actually be able to see the real, the original, I'll say, the original doors on the baptistry. And there's a lot of reasons for that. One, vandalism, damage, fears, things like that. There's also a couple of world wars in there where you're like, we've got to protect these, the art, right? So um, they're now actually on view in a neighboring museum, which you must go to if you're in Florence. It's called the Opera del Duomo and it's an amazing museum, but you can actually see the doors, both sets of doors in there. Um, the originals, and you can see the competition um, entries, um, all the, the four entries from the sacrifice of Isaac, including Brunelleschi's, and kind of compare and think, hmm, did the right guy win? I think the right guy did win, but it's fun to look, right? Um, you know, so, but what you do see on the outside of, of these baptistries are one of three uh, copies and these copies are almost exact. Like if I hadn't studied the art history, if I had gone there and seen this, I would have been like, this is amazing. This is, it looks exactly the same. Um, it's a cast, but it, it was done very well. So you can see those on the door and still get the feel of how it should look. And, and I feel like it's, it's on the level. Maybe it's not the original, but it, it could be, it's, it's very well done. One of those is in Florence and the other two are actually in the U S uh, a wonderful museum in Kansas City, the Nelson Atkins Museum. They have one set of doors. And if you read my blog, I have a link to a, kind of a resource guide they have. There's also another set of doors that are in San Francisco at the Grace uh, Chapel, an Episcopal church that you can see. And they're stunning as well. But hopefully one day you can get to Florence. I want to thank you for your time. Uh, and please don't forget to subscribe to the blog on artexpeditiontours.com or get on our Facebook page. We're also on Patreon. And if you join the Patreon, you're able to get access to additional content, classes, things like that. And I appreciate it. And make sure too to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Thanks.